what scares you the most? What scares you the most? Of, of all the things that are happening in the world, of all the things that could happen, what are you afraid of? What brings out fear and stress and worry in who you are and in your heart? Uh, there are probably different things for different people. I had to uh, go into the loft or the, the roof of our garage yesterday and uh, as I've discovered as I've got older, I'm not sure it's just because I've got heavier, but certainly as I've got older and become wiser, I was standing at the top of the ladder thinking, what am I doing? Is this not why the Lord gave me teenage sons? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and I have, uh, as a child, I had no problem climbing up ladders and climbing on roofs and climbing in trees. As I've got older, I am more and more petrified of heights. Uh, terra firma and me are very good friends. Uh, are there things like that that maybe make you afraid? Are there things that, like that that scare you? Maybe, maybe you're scared of spiders. I hope not because there's a very big one at the back of the arm. Uh, maybe you're scared of the dark, which means ESCOM and load shedding are not helping you anything at all at the moment. Uh, maybe you are afraid of sickness. Maybe you are afraid of the struggles of life. Maybe you're afraid of broken relationships. Maybe you're afraid of dying. See, the truth is there's an awful lot in our world of which we could be afraid. Uh, lots of things that happen that might terrify us and scare us. Uh, the truth is fear is part of life in this world. Uh, it's probably worth just qualifying right at the start. Uh, when I talk about fear today, I'm talking about fear as an emotion. I'm talking about fear connected to our circumstances, whether real or perceived. I'm talking about fear that is different from a clinical fear, a clinical anxiety. Now, that's way more complex. So I'm talking about it more as an emotion. I'm talking about it as that emotion that gives rise to our fight or flight response, uh, things that, that uh, usually would happen, or the response that usually happens when we face threat or danger or pain or harm. Uh, it's usually real, but sometimes it's perceived. Uh, usually it's in the present. Sometimes it can be an anticipation of the future. Uh, often it causes physiological and behavioral change in us. And often left untreated, left undealt with, it can actually become way more significant and even psychotic. Uh, but fear in the normal sense of it, and my guess is that we all, we all experience fear to some degree or another as we go through life. Uh, the truth is we all fear something or someone at some time and at some point. In Psalm 46, so do you open the passage Juliet read for us, the psalmist understands the reality of fear. He gets that as you and I live in this world, there are things that cause fear. Uh, he's introduced it in the first verse when he talks about you and me being in trouble in one form or another, but he goes on to unpack in two specific cases what our fear might be rooted in. Then if you picked it up, the first is that there might be fear caused by natural disaster. Have a look at verse 3 and verse 2. Uh, when the waters roar, when the foam and the mountains quake, when the earth gives way, when the mountains fall into the sea. See, that's natural, isn't it? That's the physical realm. And it's the chaos that comes from living in a broken world. And often living in a broken world where natural disaster strikes, where, where things happen, that undermines our security. It undermines our confidence. It often undermines our physical safety. We're not sure when the next physical danger might befall us. Uh, there was photos recently of a sinkhole just down the road here on the M5. Can you imagine driving your car? And next thing there's no road. Boop, you've fallen away. See, sometimes the earth gives way. <laughs> what then? Interestingly, the psalmist doesn't just think about the natural physical world. He thinks about, have a look down at verse 6. He thinks too about political disaster. When nations are in uproar, when kingdoms fall. He understands that you and I live in a world where there is conflict. Conflict between sinful nations, conflict between sinful tribes, conflict between sinful people. Conflict that unsettles our peace, conflict that undermines our personal security. Uh, we never know where the next hotspot will be. Well, we've seen that in our own country, haven't we? Uh, we saw the riots just a few years ago. 
Uh, it's often, it's easy it, in our modern world to see some of the parallels to this. Uh, we live in a world where we read about earthquakes and tsunamis and floods and famines. In our own country, uh, my guess is our biggest fear at the moment is total blackout, isn't it? Well, if it wasn't, it should be now. I was at a dinner last night, uh, a couple of businessmen were there, and uh, they were talking about what will what, happen if the grid falls over. I didn't quite understand what they were saying, but I just smiled. But apparently we don't want the grid to fall over. Because apparently if the grid falls over, it takes a long time to get back up. So you're supposed to have two weeks worth of food in your kitchen at the moment. Did you know that? That's what I'm told. I have to go and buy dog food straight after the service today. Because the dogs don't have two weeks worth of food. <laughs> See, the truth is, the forms of unrest, the forms of danger, the forms of threat come at multiple levels in multiple ways at multiple degrees. And so even as we sit here this morning, we're smiling, we're joking, we're laughing with each other, uh, but the truth is for some of us sitting here this morning, that chaos or that conflict might actually be close to home. Uh, it might be that we are facing very difficult circumstances. It might be we're facing sickness in our family. It might be we're facing broken relationships. It might be we're facing hostile people. It might be that in our world, we know what it is to experience chaos and what it is to be experience conflict. And the truth is that terrifies us. We know what it is to be afraid. But the psalmist asks an important question. How will you and I respond? How will you and I respond to that? If this is part of life, how will we respond? Certainly how will we as Christians, how will we as the church, how will we as God's people, how will we respond to this? Well, if you look at verse 2, the psalmist is hoping that because we are God's people, that we will not fear. That we will not fear. That we will not be overwhelmed. In fact, the psalmist actually wants us not just not to fear, but to resolve not to fear. To make a decision not to fear. Did you notice that? Look at verse 2. Having just told us who God is in verse 1, here's how he expects God's people to respond. Therefore, uh, because we know about God, because we know who God is and what God is like, we will choose when fear comes, when those chaos and calamities come, when the crisis breaks into our world, we will choose not to fear. We will resolve not to fear. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We will take appropriate action. <laughs> we will do what's necessary to deal with the issue at hand. I'm not saying we just sit and take it. Now, if there is a threat, we avoid it. If there is a danger, we escape it. But here's the thing. We will decide not to be dominated by fear. We will, we will resolve not to be defeated by fear. We will not let that event, whatever it is, determine who we are or how we respond. See, our confidence, our confidence is not determined by the chaos, however frightening it might be. And our confidence is not determined by the conflict, however hostile it might be. And our confidence is not determined by our circumstances, however uncertain they might be. Now, our confidence is rooted in what we know about God. Isn't that what it means to be Christian? Doesn't it mean to have a big view of God that shapes how we respond to the world around us? that shapes how we respond to circumstances in the world? Well, as we look at Psalm 46 today, I want you to notice that, that, that when he says to you, look, don't fear, don't fear, what, what he's going to do is he's going to say, don't fear, rather have a big view of God. R rather let your mind and your emotions be transformed by the truth of who God is. And he paints for us a beautiful picture of God and three things about God in particular that help us resolve not to fear. The first is, will you notice God's strength? God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The psalmist reminds us that God can protect you and me against 
any chaos. And he can overcome any conflict. Uh, Did you notice there was a refrain that's repeated twice in the psalm? The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Uh, It's an interesting phrase, and I think it's chosen significantly and deliberately. See, the Lord Almighty is a picture of God as the divine warrior. The warrior who leads a heavenly host against cosmic forces, against human foes. Uh, The picture of a warrior who maintains order in his world. A God who rules and reigns supremely. See, that's the picture of our God the psalmist wants us to have. Uh, Just think of him as creator, we know this. As creator, he can handle any chaos that the physical realm can throw at him. But as warrior... As warrior, he can defeat any conflict that humans might bring to him. I wonder if you've worked it out yet that you have the best warrior on your side. I I know this is very hard to believe, but when I was younger, I was quite small. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But the truth is, I was actually the shortest person in my standard six class. That's grade eight. Uh, Shortest person, not necessarily the thinnest person, but the shortest person. Um, But that didn't stop me. Uh, Some things that haven't changed is I had a big mouth then, just like I've got a big mouth now. And so I went through primary school picking a fight with anybody and everybody. I, I would do that. I would chirp anybody. I wasn't afraid of anybody. But you know why I wasn't afraid of anybody? because I had a big brother. <laughs> and the truth is, when, 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 when I said too much, when, when I chewed more, a bit of more than I could chew, did you know what I did? I just ran to my big butt. That's all I did. And I expected my big butt to take care of me. The problem is eventually he became the problem, but that's another story. See, I wonder if you've worked out how big your God is, who's on your side. I wonder if you've worked out there is a Big brother. There is a a Lord Almighty. There is a holy warrior who is on your side. Who who says to you, I'm fighting for you. I will battle with you. Now just think about it. If he is for us, what do we need to fear? What do we need to be afraid of? How, How can mountains quaking, how can the sea raging... How can the earth giving way, how could that possibly unsettle the creator who put them where they are? Uh, Think about it. What enemies, what armies could possibly threaten the God who made them and appointed them to be where they are? See, sometimes our view of God is very small. God is much stronger than anything or anyone in the world. That's why the psalmist calls him our refuge and our fortress. Just think about those terms. Our refuge, a safe harbor amidst the storm, a place of shelter while the storm blows off. I remember years ago uh, I visited Hermanus. Uh, It's a beautiful little town. Um, You'll know it well. I remember the wind was blowing, the sea was raging, and as we walked down, remember the old harbor? You go down those stairs to the old harbor, the water was just calm. It was incredible to see because because you had this water like raging all over in the ocean, and in the harbor, it was just still. That's what harbors do, aren't they? They're a refuge, a safe harbor amidst the storm, a fortress, an impregnable place of safety in the face of opposition. See, that's how the psalmist understands God. He is strong and he is our refuge. Please, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm crystal clear the chaos is still chaotic. And I'm crystal clear that the conflict is still hostile. I understand that. I understand that evasive action is necessary. I understand that the psalmist is not calling us to be martyrs on every occasion. But here's the thing. When we have a different view of God, When we see God as in control and sovereign and strong, when we see him as our refuge, then we're not dominated by that fear. We're not defined by that fear. We're not paralyzed by that fear. 
You see, we have a different perspective. We have balance in the moment. See, in the moment, because of our view of God, we're able to press on. We're able to respond wisely. We're able to act carefully. See, in those moments, we're not paralyzed by fear. And so the psalmist says to us, resolve not to fear because you are confident in God's strength. And so let me push your buttons and ask a personal question. See, are there times where we are overwhelmed because actually our view of God is that God is too weak? Is our view of God too small in the heat of the moment? We've got to have a right view of God's strength. We've also got to have a right view of God's salvation. Look down at verse 5, God's salvation. God is within her. It's actually talking about the city of Jerusalem. And she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. See, here's what the psalmist does. He remembers a previous deliverance of the city of Jerusalem. He remembers a time where they were held under siege, but when the city did not fall. Uh, Based on the history of the psalm and the dating of the psalm, it's probable uh, that he's thinking of when the king of Assyria, a man by the name of Sennacherib, uh, you probably want to think about a name like that. I don't suggest that's how you name your kids today. But anyway, Sennacherib, uh, he besieged Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah, who was the king of Israel at the time, and the prophet Isaiah prayed to God. They beseeched God. They knew that God was strong and mighty, that God was the Lord Almighty. And so they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And you can go and read this in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 over lunchtime, but we remember the story where God sent an angel of death who destroyed nearly 200,000 Assyrian soldiers without an Israelite taking out a sword. And the result, Sennacherib withdrew and fled. Jerusalem was saved. Israel was saved. Be clear, be clear that the psalmist's confidence is not in the city. It's not in the city of Jerusalem. It's not about the place. No, it is about the one who dwells in the city. It is about the Most High who dwells there. It's about God's presence within her. See, here's what the psalmist knows, that God's light will dispel darkness at the break of day. And so he appeals to those who are fearful to remember God's past salvation. Come and see, look at verse 8. Come and see what the Lord has done. Remember the desolations he's brought to the earth. Yes, you face chaos. Yes, you face conflict. But you do so knowing that God can and does save his people. Our God brings desolation. Our God makes wars to cease. Our God brings peace. Our God saves his people. I hope you know that. Our God is not just pie in the sky. Our God is a God who clothed himself in flesh to save his people from their greatest need. And the psalmist, as he writes, even before that, he writes thinking of past deliverance. And he says it's that past deliverance that gives us quiet confidence for our future vindication. So he sees not just God as a God of refuge. He sees God as a God of rescue. He's confident that God is a saving God who rescues his people. And he says when you face your present circumstances, you need to do that with the wisdom, with the wisdom of past deliverance. Paul says something similar actually in Romans chapter 8 to Christians. He, He talks about Christians who are facing suffering and hardship who might be facing chaos and conflict. And he says to them, he says, but don't forget the cross. Don't forget Easter. Don't forget what God has already done for you. Don't forget how God has saved you. Let me tell you how he says it. He says in Romans 8 this, he says, as you and I face suffering and hardship and difficulty, he says, what then shall we say in response to these things? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? See, see if God has given you his son to save you from your greatest need, why do we think that he won't save us? Now, let's just be clear. I don't think this is a guarantee that things will always work out the way we hope. Just for the record, Jerusalem did fall a few years later. 
Now, sometimes things do not work out in this world the way we hope, the way we want. Now, sometimes there is loss. Sometimes our fear becomes a reality and sometimes it is terrible. But when we remember that God is a saving God, there is always an assurance that no matter what happens to us in this world, our eternal future is always secure. It's always secure. And it's always secure because God has already secured it. He sent his son to die that you have a future. And as you go through great difficulties and as you go through great hardships, and no doubt if you're anything like me, starting to question God and saying, is God really there and does he love me? Then can I say to you, come and see what the Lord has done. Come and stand again at the foot of the cross. See his great love for you in sacrificing his son. See his great salvation of you in dealing with your enemies and particularly in dealing with death. And then despite what you are going through, will you resolve not to fear because you are confident, not in your circumstances, but in God's salvation. See, sometimes, sometimes I think we are overwhelmed by our circumstances because we are not secure in our faith. And the psalmist wants us to remember not just God's strength, but he wants us to remember God's salvation. And lastly, and with this we'll finish, well, you also notice God's sovereignty. Look down at verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Just to be clear, that's not an invitation to some kind of tranquil meditation. <laughs> that you and I sit down in the lotus position, hum a song, and hmm. You know, that, no, that's not what it means to know that God is God. Now this call, be still and know that I am God, is not an invita invitation to meditation, but it is a command to remember who God is. It is a command to remember that God is and always will be God. Even when the chaos suggests otherwise. Even when the conflict is extreme. I've been in ministry for 30 years. I have sat next to hospital beds and dying beds too often. I have sat with families as they grieve and as they mourn and as they feel hopeless. And in almost every situation, the only thing I can do to remind them is to say to them, despite what you are feeling right now, despite what you are thinking right now, let me tell you this one great truth. God is still God. And God is still on his throne. Nothing will change that. No pain, no heartache, no, no political disaster, no natural disaster. None of that will ever change the great truth that God is still God. I hope you know that this morning. See, for the psalmist, the Lord is so sovereign, so in control, so God, that neither cosmic instability nor hostile nations need to be feared. See, the psalmist sees in God's past deliverance and present strength both a foretaste and a pledge of the day when God will finally overthrow all disaster, when all wars will finally come to an end. And he will establish his kingdom and his peace for all eternity. The psalmist anticipates, regardless of what he's going through, he anticipates a day when calm is restored. And he knows this. He knows that on that day, God alone will be exalted among the nations. He knows that on that day, God alone will be exalted in all the earth. See, sometimes... Our response to fear and our response to the things we're going through is to get a bigger view of God. Sometimes our view of God is just too small. I remember hearing a sermon in 1996. A long time ago, isn't it? I'll never forget. I can even tell you who preached it. 
Bishop Joe Bell preached it. And he preached it in our little church in Durban. I was looking after the church called Trinity Chapel in Durban. And Joe Bell preached a sermon for us. I confess, I cannot tell you what the text was. I can't tell you what passage it was, but I'll never forget this. He said, I remember him over and over. It was the refrain through the sermon. If your problem is too big, your God is too small. If your problem is too big, your God is too small. See, that's what the psalmist wants us to understand. Yes, you might have very real problems. I don't want to diminish those. I don't want to minimize those. They might be very real problems and very real struggles and very real threats. But, but, God is bigger. God is bigger. And that's why the psalmist wants God to be our reverence. He, he wants us to replace our fear of the chaos and our fear of the conflict with a right fear, with a holy fear, with a reverence and a respect for God. He wants us to have a faith in a sovereign God that allows us to deal with the issues in this world unafraid. Sure, again, I'm going to say it. Our concern should be there. Our caution should be there. We should take actions carefully. But for those of us who recognize God's sovereignty, faith must always prevail. See, we can trust in a sovereign God who always fulfills his promises, who always brings his plans to pass, not just for his glory, but for our good. See, we resolve not to fear because our God is bigger. And it might be, it might be that if the problem is getting away from us, it might be if the problem is overwhelming us, it might be if the chaos or conflict is becoming too much, maybe the solution will be to be still and to remember that God is still God. I'm crystal clear that we live in a world where fear is very real. But if we are God's people, then our faith must be real too. Our faith can't be theory. Our faith can't be a Sunday church event. Our faith must be life real. It must work itself out in how we respond to the events and the circumstances around us. Yes, there might be lots in this world that tempt us to be afraid, but we must resolve not to let fear dominate us, not to let fear defeat us, because our confidence is in God. You remember I started by asking you, of what are you afraid? What scares you the most? Let me finish by asking a different question, but related. How big is your God? How big is your God? Is your God the God who is strong? Is your God the God who saves? Is your God the God who is sovereign over all? Because when He is, then our faith takes the place of fear. When He is, that's when we find that peace that surpasses all understanding. Let's pray.